you, uh, Srishti, and thank you everyone for uh, inviting us into your space. It's really uh, great to, to be here with you all from different parts of the world. Um, me, myself, I'm in, uh, I'm in Rome. It's uh, afternoon uh, for me. Um, and uh, yes, the, the journey of how I got to uh, Fundaction, it's an uh, interesting one. And it's actually thanks to Mina that I got to Fundaction. <laughs> um, uh, so Fundaction, we are, um, as was mentioned, we're um, a community and network of uh, activists from all over, um, over Europe. So we're limited for now to, to Europe, let's say. So right now we have around 250 activists who are in like 30 countries. Um, and what we all have in common is that we do grassroots activism and that we uh, all work on like deep systems change. Like we really try to address the root causes of a problem where we don't do, do charity or cosmetic stuff. We really want to do more the political um, like struggle of really changing something and also developing alternative solutions. Uh, that's kind of what brings us together. And we really work on many, many, many different topics. So migration, anti-trafficking is also a topic that some of our members work on. Uh, we have climate justice, racial justice, uh, digital rights, uh, independent journalism, democratic innovation, feminist, feminism, anti-discrimination in general, all kinds of things. Um, and uh, until very recently, because, you know, we are kind of relatively young, so we are really like in full operations for like five years or so. And since we are, you know, a community, but of course, in the first place, a fund. So the idea is that we like distribute money to the different, um, to our different members, is that we were a bit, you know, kind of um, cautious in how quickly we want to grow the community, because of course, you have a limited pot of money that you try to secure from the from the funders that you then distribute among the members. So until recently, the only way that you could join the community was by invitation. So we had like a, a core community that started and then we opened from time to time and an, a member could invite two groups, two new activists in that they knew that kind of fit the profile of the community and that could benefit of the funding. And that's when Mina invited me in. Um, so Mina was a member before me. And at the time I was um, working in um, a local initiative in Lesbos on, in the island uh, in Greece, um, where it was, um, yeah, 2017, 18, I want to say. So um, still, I mean, also as today, many arrivals uh, by boat uh, from people crossing the Aegean Sea from, uh, from Turkey, nationalities, of course, reflecting, you know, where and on the other side, uh, their country was on fire and where they were experiencing um, problems. And uh, of course, one of the, the key issues that I think will resonate with many people on the call, um, many issues that we had being like a, a local initiative that, you know, we were not a big NGO. We were really started by some local Greeks who just wanted to do a solidarity initiative for people in Lesbos, like locals who needed help, but also people arriving, people arriving by boat who needed help. So we didn't have access to like the big EU funding or whatever, and we were always scrambling to, um, to find money for our activities. So um, yeah, I joined, um, I joined Fund Action on Mina's invitation to, yeah, try to then apply for, uh, for projects to get yeah money to the local initiative uh, and the stuff that we were doing in Lesbos. Um, and my interest personally was also very much about, you know, the fact that as activists, I'm talking, I guess, for myself now, but I do see it as a pattern uh, with many of my colleagues activists. We don't really like so much to talk about money. I mean, we need it, of course, for our struggles. We need it to do our work, but we want to do the work. Like we want to do the stuff that, you know, we are passionate about and continue with our struggles. We don't want to spend our nights and weekends filling in long applications of funders and also often applying for projects that the funder, you know, thought was a good idea, but that we know on the ground actually doesn't make sense. But it's the only way, you know, to get the funding and then you have to kind of adjust your activity. So all of these things. So for me, 
That's why I thought fund action was uh, because I'm very interested in like, how do you deeply change systems? And, you know, money is power. <laughs> And, you know, funders, as we also know, also set agendas because they decide in the end, you know, which money is available, where the money goes, on which terms. So I found it really interesting. And then it kind of by now it has become my part of my struggles in itself to really think about and see how we can, yeah, change and challenge the world of philanthropy and the power that they hold, like over us who, you know, are the people in our local communities, a lot of, of course, community-led initiatives, people with lived experience who actually, yeah, know what needs to get done and they shouldn't be dictated by funders um, on the on the how and, um, and the what. So yeah, that's kind of it for me. I'll pass on to Mina. Yeah, thank you. And um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being in this room together and also thank you for inviting us to your space but also they I feel very safe in this space so I'm very happy to share my experience as well and so I think like I'm um, my name is Mina right now I'm based in the UK I moved recently to UK from Denmark and um, I'm a community coordinator women's center at Hippie Schools, where we also work with the uh, survivor of trafficking and um, women there are keeping the criminal justice system in the UK. And at the same time, I have founded my organization for yet eight years ago, which is Women Refugee Route. And um, I want to talk more about that part with the link of Fund Action. It's like more at that point that I want to talk women refugee route as an organization that's pan European but I founded it back in uh, 2015 was because I have been working in the migration asylum and migration space for many years um, including that I was also myself came to Europe uh, as a refugee from Kurdistan the part of Iraq and have been like you know lived in many different asylum center, work in different asylum center and settings. And through all my life, I felt like there was really a huge gender gap in the way the, the migration space and advocacy was operating, especially talking about changing the system power. Like, so all the structure I've been working with or living as a lived experience, there was always a gap to talk about the gender and like having more women in the front line to be able to be advocating, speaking on behalf of themselves. This is why I founded back, uh, like back in 2015, refugee women refugee route. And the struggle was big. The struggle was very big because um, it was very needed and there was a huge gap of having more women's organization lived by lived experience, but at the same time, like not having access to funding or like if you even had access to any funding you will not get it because there were so many competition and definitely a person with lived experience will definitely not be accounted to get that uh, um, definitely not be the one who will be choosing for the funding which was available um, at the time and then um, on I think in the same time that I started women refugee out through my network, I learned about fund action from the beginning, understanding this was a fund action that actually want to talk about the systematic uh, challenge that a grassroots organization like my organization faced at the time, not having access to any funds. So ever like whatever project who was implementing, which was actually very powerful and like, you know, had a huge impact on the people who was affected by, will not any will not get any funder or they were like self-funded. I got in touch with Fund Action, I think also the same way as Carmen did through me. And I got it through another member of uh, Fund Action who was also part of starting the Fund Action, which should be a space where actually we could get um, a collaboration, you know, and not having a lot of power dynamic between the funder and between the grassroots. And for me, it was like, not even imaginable because of all the struggle that I had with funders before and coming into coming into fund action I learned a lot of like the power dynamic in philanthropy 
and also like being closer to funders, like having conversation with funders. I think I got a lot of courage as like live experienced person in the standing, not even being able to be in a space where as a community who have different struggle that we actually could apply for in a platform within fund action for the same grant. And for the first time, I actually felt I was very engaged in others project and want to collaborate with them. Even if I didn't get that opportunity to receive the grant, I was still interested in who will be get, getting the grant because everything was very trans, is everything was very trans, um, transparent of the way the voting and writing proposal and choosing for the proposal and afterwards following the process of the proposal that have been choose. For me, I think it was part of a community that led my own like project to get more engaged. But at the same time, we also received um, funding, which I didn't believe it in the beginning because, you know, the traditional funding was so difficult to get. And here you actually had like, you know, it was not the same way and you really could feel that. Like even this was very limited of, like this is not the biggest grant you could get as a lift like for a small organization but it was good to get into it and then understand it of the foundation of getting you know uh, getting fun for it i think so what i want to share with that i think what i learned through this participatory grant making was actually you get really much in power and you really understand like you is you really understand the power dynamic, how it's work outside of fund action. And you get really a lot of knowledge about actually how to op like approach funders, and especially because funders are trying now to change in their approach and changing that approach to get closer, which is still difficult for them, because in my opinion, they're still operating in a white supremacy operation. Like, you know, it's like very difficult for them to understand. Um, and the way like understanding the grassroots understanding the perspective of like you know is giving grand away is like about trust base and not accountability and um, but i felt like fund action had been given me that resources and knowledge um, and also courage to understand how do i operate and how do i actually it's like you know also um, continue collaborating with other funders, even they are not within fund action. So I can, if, like, as a person being part of fund action, I got so much space and also network to talk to how we actually can do that. And besides that, I think one of the most like interesting part for me at fund action that have been is like there is no five um like five old middle-aged men who is deciding what project or what like project that need to be decided and voted for is the within the community with that we vote so it's very much trust-based so you don't feel like you have to defend why what you do isn't wrong because i always felt whenever i have to defend my project it's like you don't know anything why should i even defend it what is it about you know you don't even know anything about it and this is like a continue operation the traditional funder is doing right i challenge you on something they even don't know anything about where in fund action is totally different and so this was like the best experience as a um a activist in in uh, like you know grassroots organization to receive from fund action community the second thing is like being part of fund action for so many years i also uh, collaborated funding together with other partners and network. And I think that has been like the most exciting because there were so many other women's organization, feminist organization that I haven't been collaborating to apply for funding in other funding organization, even with women's funding, because we will always be a competition to each other. Where in Fund Action, you have a platform where you actually can go together and apply for funding together. So we did that process, not that we received it, but like having, like even doing that and be able to share because you have shame, because you actually um, giving the same, you, you know, you save the same area 
that I think is really empowered. And this is what we want to see, like more community working together and be stronger together. And the last thing is also like for me as a person who didn't even couldn't reach a call with the funders, like being part of a facilitation group. I think that's something Carmen will come back to about like how we operate and how we structure. But I've been part of this facilitation group. So I also could like facilitate different areas of the fund action. But that didn't have given me any power between me or the community. It's just like a flat organization that we just try to like change our power day, like change our um, position to be in facilitation group and being a member. And that can change for every second year. Um, yeah. So it's like a lot of things you can hear from my experience that I have been gained, but I also feel like um, it has been opening so much opportunity for me. The way I'm operating today is definitely with the funders and philanthropy is definitely not the way I will have talking to them back in 2015. Thanks, Mina. Yeah, I just want to go back to a little bit more about, and I think the group will also appreciate uh, the, uh, could you explain the structure a little bit, uh, Carmen, because it is a collaborative fund, right? You still engage with traditional grant makers and what changes it when you have this aggregate fund and then the whole facilitation group, et cetera, comes in. So if you could just explain that structure a little bit for everyone, how that works. Yeah, sure. So we are also very much a, a living mechanism. So we are in constant transition and change. It's also one of our features because we believe that's healthy also to like keep like adjusting yourself. And we're very transparent about what we learn and then we try to find new ways. Um, so right now we are in transition. What is the red thread, which is the, the thing that we do not touch on is the fact that we are doing everything in a fully participatory and democratic way. So we consult the community and the community is, you know, is commenting and voting on all the crucial issues for the community. So what um, Mina mentioned about the facilitation group. So how we are organized right now is that basically we elect among the membership, among the community members, we kind of elect a point, um, a small facilitation group, which is basically like a coordination team. Um, who receives a compensation for the work that they devote to, to fund action. But, you know, most of them, they do it, of course, with their ongoing activism work. So we still don't have paid staff or anything. It's kind of people who say, okay, I want to devote some of my time and energy to fund action, to this community. So they kind of keep, they facilitate the daily operations. Um, and each of them is kind of responsible for following up on a main area. So also, um, I think Mina did community building and communication in the past. I'm taking now like the coordinator role of the group. So I kind of keep things a bit together. Uh, we have a fundraising working group. We have the grant making working group that looks into adjusting how we do the processes and the grant making. Um, so we have different working groups that are kind of led by some person in the facilitation group. But all, so we are all community members contributing in one way or the other, getting also fair compensation for that. But the whole idea is that we try to engage each other and the community. Um, and that also, the, you know, the facilitation group cannot kind of in their weekly meeting, let's say, decide on something. They have to bring it for consultation to the community. And in that, of course, our online platform is crucial. So we really couldn't function without our online assembly. We call it our platform. Um, so we law we like put all important like processes for people to comment on on the on the platform, and also all our like the grant making processes that some of it Mina started to describe is happening on there. So let's say at some point in the year we will say we are launching the Renew Grant. So until, I don't know, two months from now, you all get the chance to apply with your project in the platform, which is a very, very simple form because we want to keep it really like, you know, low threshold, very simple for people to respond to some questions. So we get the gist of what the project is about and people put it on the platform, which means as soon as you put your project there, everybody can read it, like full transparency, as Mina mentioned. 
And then we open the commenting phase. So everybody can go in and start commenting. For example, I can say, oh, there's people, you know, activists who do this, I don't know, a housing project for people on the move in Serbia. And I did something similar in Lesbos and I learned from that. So I can go in, in the project and say, ah, really interesting, you know, let's talk, be careful for that, or let's do something together, like Mina mentioned. So it's again, also kind of nourishing potential collaborations. We close the commenting and we go into voting. And then uh, how it is now is that every member has five votes that they can distribute among all the projects. We do a top ranking of the projects. And in the, um, the grants that are bigger, like the Renew grant is our biggest grant of 20,000 per project. We also add uh, a peer-to-peer -peer panel. So we randomly select a few people in the community who get paid also to be part of this process. And they kind of have a conversation with like the, the top list of the, of, the, of the candidates, which is really interesting because, you know, it's, of course, we can't totally, you know, move away from this thing. In the end, we still have to decide, right, who gets the funding and who not, like there, there's no way around it. But the feedback that we get from people, and it would be interesting to hear from Mina as well on this, is that people, like community members who are part from a peer-to-peer -peer panel, because they're kind of on the other side, and they talk, you know, to an, an activist who is applying for a, a project. They also learn a lot about the other people in the community. But also, you know, they learn in a way, you know, it's like mirroring. They see themselves also, you know, in this process with the funders. So it's like a really interesting experience for people that also brings people closer to fund action. So we feel that when people have been part of a peer-to-peer -peer panel, they get active in many other ways as well. And uh, in terms of the role of the funders, so what we very much, our approach with funders is that um, we have some red lines, right? So we, we kind of only um, accept unrestricted funding. So funders who like want to work on a specific uh, topic, we, we try to move away from that. Like we don't want to get like donor driven because, you know, let's say a certain issue is very hot on the, on the agenda. So they want to you know, kind of work on it. Um, and we very much invite funders, of course, to have like a long-term um, relationship with us and like, you know, have a long-term approach and also like giving giving money. Um, and also really to like join us as an ally, as a partner very much. So we invite them into, we invite them in as a member. They become a member. They have access to the platform. They see everything happening there. They can comment as well. The only thing that they cannot do is decide. <laughs> so they cannot vote. They cannot decide because that's where we try to shift the power dynamics, right? So we say it's up to the people on the ground and with lived experience. They know what's needed, what needs to be done. And as a funder, if you join Fund Action as a funder, it means that you trust us as a community and our expertise to you know, distribute the money where uh, yeah, where we feel it's it's most needed and where it makes most sense. And then of course we also you know we have like now we have some funders who have been funding us for for quite some time, where we have a great relationship in that of course they also really promote um, fund action with other funders. So they would inv they will invite us to join in a panel about trust based philanthropy, for example. They will put us in touch with a funder who is thinking about participatory grant making. So they put us in touch with other funders, and like we, they're like catalyzers as well for like this change in philanthropy. Because also from what we heard as well from from a big funder like uh, Porticus, for example, who joined us last year. As soon as they started to get into it and they started to follow, it's like all their questions kind of disappeared. And, you know, they have confirmed that they will fund us again. And it's uh, we believe that through doing and through really being part of the process, funders also really understand, you know, the shift that is needed and this deep change. So, um, yeah. Mina, do you want to add something on that? Maybe one thing um, uh, sorry to add is that uh, just to be complete um, is that we are in a transition right now. So for, um, for a long time, we were an informal network. We had a fiscal sponsor 
Um, and we have decided um, since last year to like get on the journey of becoming an independent entity. So we have grown up now. <laughs> so we, uh, we've registered now as a foundation. So formally we are a foundation in the Netherlands. Um, so now we're in the process of opening a bank account. We wrote statutes. And that's also really interesting because, of course, if you look at the law and the legislation, you see it's, you know, it's very difficult to write statutes that are in line with our values because for us, everything is flat, horizontal, participatory. So it was a really interesting process with the notary as well to kind of, kind of like hack the legal system kind of make sure that, you know, we can keep our identity and this spirit of participation while formally, of course, we need a board. Formally, we have, we have the suit, we have everything in place, but we want to make sure that the community, as I mentioned in the beginning, is basically still the, the most important body that gets consulted on everything and that has a say on everything. Just wanted to add that. Sorry, Mina. No, I actually didn't have to, I didn't want to add anything to this part. So we'll come in any other question. Okay. Uh, I'm just gonna like also take two questions here. Uh, one is about, uh, one is from Marisa, which is about ad hoc funding. Uh, so what happens when there is a situation that arises very suddenly? And so basically any kind of urgent fund that is required. Uh, a response to that? Yeah, very good question. So on that, how, uh, how our grants are organized right now is that we have the Renew grant, which opens once a year, which is like 20,000 per project, which is really about, yeah, projects that, you know, address a system, the root cause, um, like quite an elaborate project. Um, then we have the Rethink uh, grant, which is 5,000 euros, which is really about capacity building, exchange visits, training, workshops, maybe writing up or, you know, translating a report or something. And then we have a Resist grant, which answers the, the question, um, which is um, a grant that is uh, open throughout the year. So on a rolling basis, people can apply for up to 2,000 2, euros, where they have like, yeah, an unforeseen kind of need, something urgent that emerged, where they, yeah, would like to get uh, money for quickly, that now with our fiscal sponsor, we managed to, yeah, kind of dispatch the that funding in like a matter of like a week, even I think recently we managed. Um, so very quickly, where we basically just have, uh, so the, it's, the form is always open on our platform, people fill it, uh, two people of the facilitation group minimum to check if all the criteria are met. We sign it off and uh, it gets uh, it gets paid. So it's also again transparent for the community who got the funding, who didn't. And I think for this year we have a cap of so it's basically until the money runs out. I think we have a cap of fifty thousand euros. Um, and yeah, people are applying on a rolling basis if that uh, answers the question. Having said that, we have our annual assembly, our in-person annual assembly in two weeks. That is always very exciting. And uh, because we like to uh, reinvent ourselves, we actually are going to put on the table, open up the whole discussion on how our grants organized. So it could be that in one month I'm talking to you and we have a whole different <laughs> approach because we're learning of course and people are telling us our members are telling us mm, this is a limitation you know this is not working so uh it's it might change relatively soon but that's how um, that's how it's now i think that's linked to another question in the box a chat box which is uh from Aureli, where she was asking about how do, in your approach how do found uh found funders uh are willing how are they be willing to become members or really well, i did I mean, not understand that question correctly please feel free to ask sorry i put the question in the wrong place that's okay no i was just thank you carmen thank you so much and thank you also mina i was very really uh, interested in um how you could, how you manage to find funders willing to become members, uh, because it's very specific the approach you have and very interesting. But 
I'm I'm like I'm very curious about how do you persuade them to uh, to come and to become members. Mm -hmm. Thank you for yeah. that question. I think like I can go ahead from the beginning of it. Like so, actually, fund action was also pulled out from a conversation with the activists and funders together back in 2015. No, 17. Sorry. Uh, and um, so there all there have been already interest from the funders part in the beginning of it, and um, since I ever been, uh, I can also I also think like Carmen, you can also elaborate it more in this part of it because we've been working with funders and like you know welcoming new funders. But I will also say like from the beginning of like building this platform. As have been a conversation between funders and activists actually pulled out a fund action platform. Yeah, no, and that's a very, yeah, exactly. It's a very important point to make because I would say, you know, the, the point of like, how do you convince them, let's say, to become members, I, I would say that's not really the extra step or the obstacle. When when funders uh, approach us or, you know, or when we approach funders because, you know, we understand that they are interested in participatory grant making, it means they've already made that click, right? Like they know what we stand mm -hmm. for. They know our values, our vision and mission. The tricky part that we that we often have with funders, and this is also the interesting part of the journey, I think, for all of us, is that, you know, and, and, and often they're also very transparent about it. They're nervous about it because it's new also <laughs> as an experience. So it's like they want to jump, but they don't like they're standing a bit at the edge, you know, of the of the water. And they're like, ah, there are certain things that they're not sure about or they will say, Yes, but can we maybe add this condition or can we add kind of this? And, you know, when it's like, a, let's say sometimes, you know, as an ongoing discussion, it can be a gray area that, for example, we feel then also as facilitation group, okay, we don't really know. And then we take it to the community. So we will say, okay, we got this proposal from, um, from, a, from a donor, from a funder, because sometimes also funders, uh, approaches because they want to work on a cross-cutting issue and then the question is okay but is it thematic is it donor driven is it cross-cutting so there's always these gray areas and then we bring in the community we give them you know all the information we have we do the commenting we do the voting and we kind of decide um together um but yeah it's it's definitely true that in in my experience it is a bit of a journey and it's also really interesting to kind of see how you always also find allies, you know, you find people in the more traditional funds foundations as well, who really get it and who really want to push from the inside. And those are also really interesting partnerships that we're, that we're forming. Um, another uh, interesting aspect, and then um, I'll pass it on again, is that actually right now, the majority of our funding comes from individuals of wealth where you have a really interesting movement happening, not only in Europe, but um, yeah, across um, across different continents of young people mainly, who kind of know that um, they will inherit a big fortune. So they're from rich families and they start to ask themselves a lot of questions about their privilege and uh, yeah, often also, yeah, linked to their whiteness and the money and where the money comes from and their responsibility and that and the justice aspect. So we've we've built up really interesting uh, from my point of view as an activist, it's one of the most interesting movements that has been happening uh, in the last years. Yeah, but these people who who do a lot of internal work as well and who are building up a movement to ask all these difficult questions also inside their families and you know to a very rich class that rather wouldn't hear those questions. So it's really, really interesting as well. Yeah. I will say that, and also part of it, I also have, um, like, in the standing over the year, being part of uh, Fund Action, the, the fact that the um, funders are part of our assembly, so I mean, like, taking part of our conversation, I also feel like we can, like, you know, um, transfer, transfer our knowledge to to them, which they have very lack in standing up, even though 
like you know when they are providing funding a big funding to organization uh, with a huge mess of work of evaluating they still don't have the same opportunity as they will have with the fund action because they kind of part of the community they understand if the philosophy of the community, identity of the community. So even just being part of our assembly, I also feel they get a lot of like, you know, knowledge and understanding and the, understanding the impact that we do. And I think it's also a way from us to like, you know, this is our way of evaluating back of like, you know, the trust rather than big, big reports, overwhelmed staff, and uh, yeah, so that that part I also say is very very important within uh, philanthropy and funding is like the evaluation part of it, which I feel here is like we come to a common understanding of what the fund is going to like you know. Yeah, thank thanks, Mina and Carmen. And uh, picking up on the same thread, uh, there's a question from Ray, and I have this question too was about how do you engage with the partners and grantees? And I think it in the question is more about how you do you decide on what you where is the funding going to go? Uh, like you have a wide range of thematics that you're currently funding. And if you could just speak a little bit to how these themes came about, like how did you how did it evolve? How did this it become like a long list of things that you are currently supporting? And how, what is the engagement with the community? What does it look like? Do you want to go, Mina? Or... Yeah, I could go. Like, so, and to understand your question better is like, like how do we set up the grants, right? And yeah, like the themes get... that you have, yeah. Yeah, that have been also set up by the community in the assembly, also from the first uh, um, assembly that was held back in 2017. And that have, as Carmen said, like, Every year that we have assembly, this is something that we adjust and change from the experience over the year that we have been learning as a members and contribute with that. And then we like, you know, add the change to it that will be accepted by the whole community. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there's still like fund that is long term. So you're supporting a few things long term. Uh, but is it easy to add things to it or do you have to? make a choice of not like dropping few things like how does that work like sustaining a long-term funding mm -hmm. as well as adding new issues that yeah, it's actually um and i it's a very good question because i forgot to add yeah. that because uh, exactly reflecting on your question that's also something that came up in the community we have recently decided to actually add an extra grant to the to the grant scheme that is about core core funding where um, it will be possible to uh, apply for a bigger uh, amount uh, as a group, as a, as a member, uh, that also yeah, is like a more long-term, so really it's core support for the organization, for the group, that also can be longer than one year. I mean, in general, our, I mean, our keyword is, of course, flexibility. Um, so we, we try to be as, as flexible as possible and like respond to the needs of the, um, of, the, of the group, of the member. If they say, look, we need this period of time to implement the project, and usually that's not an issue. We often get uh, requests to extend, which um, I would say, yeah, kind of almost always like the, the reasons are totally valid and we just extend it also. Um, there is, of course, I mean, there is some reporting that we that we do ask, uh, which is, of course, something, you know, also to do with due diligence, the fact that you still need to make, of course, your grant agreements and the paperwork. But where for us, the main um, point, again, is that, um, yeah, we keep it relatively, we keep it short and easy. And it's also very much to share with the others, like with the community, and also to learn from each other. So we have a, a new website, relatively new website. We share like the reports and pictures there as well. And of course, for our current funders and for future funders, it's always important that you have some like visual, you know, right? Like you can see actually where the money is, is being spent and on what topics. Um, in terms of all the topics that we, that we have in the community, the thing is, the, the the one thing that we also really want to get a bit better at, because we have limited capacity now in the team that we have, 
is to like detect some trends. I think you were maybe also hinting towards like we do see, for example, that we have in the recent grant rounds, um, like the um, like there were relatively more grants or money that went to housing uh, rights, to food uh, justice. So there were some interesting trends that, of course, we would like to understand, but then also to make sure that this is not something that is getting replicated in every grant uh, grant round to make sure that there's um, a fairness uh, kind of as well. Um, and also we are now very critically um, like looking into um, the reason why we have some members who apply for almost every grant round. And then we have members who never apply, which means there is something there, right? Like also talking about power dynamics that we have as a nanny community and inclusion. And, you know, what are the obstacles for people to not apply, uh, you know, what, where do we fail there in our, in our approach? That's also a priority for the in next, in the next two weeks when we will uh, meet in person. So it's definitely not like, you know, that we say, yes, all our processes are smooth and um, we are constantly in a learning phase. And we also feel, yeah, that that's where the, the interesting learning and change can come from. Like you have yeah. to be very kind of self-critical, uh, right? And look at, um, yeah, look at also power dynamics, people who are absent from processes and spaces and, and what is that. Yeah, and I will also add to that, like um, us not having core funding or loan project funding for our member, I feel that as a limitation from fund action, uh, fund action for now. So I'm very happy that we are like introducing the core funding because one of, of the thing with philanthropy is also like, you know, you don't keep people busy with 20K or 5K. You kind of want to give them the space of core funding, but because also like having limited access to bigger funders that have been like our way to try out uh, with like small grants, and I will say that's definitely our way to work on. Uh, and beside of that, having a platform of like, because what we want to do in, is going away from the power dynamic, but having a platform full of member who actually work in different active and different, uh, different way of activism. We can also create a power dynamic within us and like just vote in for like what we are interested in. That's like kind of also a conversation that actually had been coming up in the conversation over the year in the assembly. Okay. Uh, really, uh, again, linking to the question about uh, who you can fund and cannot fund, there's a question about, uh, and that comes, uh, I think it's more about when bureaucracy starts to raise its head, like, uh, for example, the example here is of an undocumented migrant, but also refugees, uh, when there's a requirement of funding from organizations that necessarily cannot register themselves, uh, what happens and how, what are the decision, how is the de decision making work there? Also with kind of like accountability and transparency as yeah, so I have actually experience uh, with that because uh, as Women Refugee Route, we have actually been able to apply for other member of network that didn't have a registration uh, during COVID that we had uh, um, a, a restriction. No, what was the, sorry, what was the fund that we had during COVID that we distributed to different member comments? The resist one. Yeah, the resist one. Like, so we at Women Refugee Route, we were able to actually apply for other um, organization and that like was not uh, registered. They, yeah, they were not registered. So like the fund went through us and then we like kind of operated with them. So like, I mean, it need to go to a partner okay. who they trust and like, this is how we have been doing it so far from my experience. I don't know if there's other way that you are familiar with, which I'm not, Carmen. Yeah, just to, because now the, the, the fiscal sponsor that we're working with right now, so the, how we have communicated it also to our members is that exactly as Mina said, um, like in general, we find that also members who are uh, unregistered, um, they find often around them, you know, a group they trust, to act as their fiscal sponsor and to receive the money on their behalf. 
But we do say to people, if you have any issues with that, do contact us and then we try to find a solution, a fiscal sponsor and our fiscal sponsor kind of looks into it. But I have to say that, yeah, also a, a bit still to my surprise right now, we feel like because, you know, our, you know, activists and groups are well connected. If you allow for, you know, another fiscal sponsor, a group to um, like receive that money for them. In practice, it hasn't been an obstacle and people have found it, but they can contact us if it's an obstacle for them. Okay, so the Fund Action Network in and of itself, like ends up supporting those who are unregistered in that sense. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. okay. And this whole thing is called, okay, they're, so they're fiscal sponsors. All right, got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, the other question we have here is about promoting diversity and inclusivity in composition of grant making committee. And I think that is more towards the representativeness of this grant making committee and how you ensure that. Yeah. Also a very, very good question. Um, so we we have some of these, yeah, let's say we call it peer-to-peer -peer panels because we feel also the word grant making committee already, or the, even the word grantee from a personally, it's like, you know, money is power. I think language is power as well. We try to kind of steer away from that. We fall into it sometimes, but we try to use also, I guess, language that levels, uh, that, that doesn't introduce these power dynamics. Um, right now, I feel there, yeah, we, we do have some kind of reflections to do because um, we do this random selection um, kind of way. So we like there's a way I don't know how it technologically works, but the platform kind of randomly selects people. They receive an email if they can have if they have the capacity to be on that peer to peer panel at a time. Um, and right now, because it has been not always easy also, you know, in a short time period to have people, you know, confirming that they are available, I would say that, you know, of course, we, we gender-wise, we, we ensure that it's not, let's say, an, an all-male and all-female panel, but it's been tricky there. I feel there, because it's kind of linked also a bit, I think, to the overall engagement of, of people. Where sometimes, yeah, I also feel that we maybe fall a bit into the trap of, you know, we need to also keep the processes going and, you know, we need to assemble a peer-to-peer -peer panel and then to also introduce all the different like steps of making sure we have kind of, you know, a perfect, I guess, diverse panel as possible. We fail sometimes, I feel. So it's one of the things that is, is, is also very much, as I said, on the agenda in two weeks. Because the peer-to-peer -peer panel, you know, and also, you know, on our facilitation group, you know, who is there, who is not there in all our different bodies, um, governance bodies and so on. I mean, for me, that's like the final step. It helps, of course, to have diversity, but we need a very deep, I would say, um, an overall approach to diversity inclusion, as I mentioned earlier, where, you know, starting from who is in the community and who isn't who's applying, who's not applying, who feels welcome, not welcome. But yeah, what does it mean that, you know, maybe some people don't even yet also apply to be in the facilitation group coordination team. So all of this is something that we feel right now. It's something we need to do some really, yeah, deep, deep work on, I think it's the summary. But I'm curious to hear Mina on this as well. Um, yeah, I think also like, um, um, yeah, if you like, sorry, I lost a bit of your question. Mina, we were discussing about uh, inclusivity and diversity yeah. in the composition yeah. of grant making committee. And yeah, exactly. That we, I just want to decide it correct. Like, yeah. also like, special, I also feel that like, you know, um, sometime, um, this is like the conversation because we are activists and we come from different background. It seems, it, oh, sorry, I'm also a bit sick today. <laughs> like, uh, but the uh, so subtype is really difficult uh, to put that conversation because act activists sometimes actually we assume that we actually are inclusive. Uh, because we do certain of work, so we see ourselves, we're not reflecting on our own 
like you know our own identity or privilege because as activists we also do have different uh, different way of privileging and uh, i see often like within our groups there is like more power in certain area but that's i also feel like we have been very good to take that conversation in like you know making this conversation open and this is also a conversation that we will be opening doing assembly but we will also have the discussion like but i mean we haven't been limited in certain way of saying actually like you know we want to try the way that we are actually run like once they apply we look at the gender geographic and also project where we can like you know what it can come to uh, for the shortlisted when it's about peer to peer they have this understanding of they have to understand the geographic but it's not that is most important when we talk about inclusion inclusion is like you have people in the membership that actually don't apply and sometimes they don't apply because they applied once and they cannot vote it so they demotivated so it's really about us to go back to them and say like you know and like informing them that like if being invited to the assembly or other project that we do and encourage them to apply i think is the way that we can go ahead but i think also following up on the missing or gapping inclusivity is also something i will not say we're perfect on it but it's ongoing conversation we are not definitely the one who do the best in this but the, our way of operating is like it linked to a reflection of that right okay so it seems like an iterative process that you have to revisit almost every year okay yeah and i mean and also like it's like we are many that have that have understanding about that you know what is lacking so it's naturally the conversation is coming up and as saying like some activists is not reflecting about it that mean that the whole community is not doing it just to like clear that out okay uh two more questions is about uh, this specifically about the funding calendar of fund action and when do you open for call and what does that pro and how long does the process take and the second is do you consider organizational development as an area of funding i think mm -hmm. that means core grant i think yeah exactly yeah on the last uh yeah on the last question i would say it's kind of the new grant that we want to launch also later this year for the first time so um yeah just a bit. organizational development depends on what it is but also but that's only five thousand euros would also kind of fit under capacity building and under this rethink grant that we have it's like if it's like a specific process maybe that people want to do inside their organizations um in terms of the um, of the calendar um yeah i'll talk a bit about the grants calendar but then also maybe because this is something i want to emphasize also for this community um how you can become a member potentially of the fund action community because that might be interesting um but yeah the grants calendar um Kind of usually, but also this year, for several reasons, we're de deviating uh, from it. The, um, the kind of general um, trend has been that we open like, um, I think, a rethink uh, grant. So the one of 5,000, we open it kind of around um, around spring, usually. And then people start like from September implementing a project. And the renew grant, like the bigger one, um, kind of we we usually launch the applications more towards the end of the year, and we try to have the final decision before Christmas. And the resist is open on a rolling basis. But yeah, it kind of also um, yeah sometimes it depends on internal processes. Like now with the transition this year, it's a bit of a different year than than previous years. Uh, we try to, I mean, our ambition is, of course, to be as predictable as possible, because the whole idea is that, you know, we want to make sure that people don't, you know, kind of have to spend their weekends and their evenings doing this. So if they know, of course, if people know from the beginning of the year, okay, there's a renew grant that, you know, I can apply for in October, it helps people to, to plan, of course, also their work. So we would like to be a bit more predictable still um, in this um and in terms of members new members i also wanted to say so we so i mentioned from the in in the very beginning that until actually 
a few months ago, the only way to, to enter into the Fund Action community was by invitation, which we have been saying for more than a year now that it's, you know, it's not something that we want to keep as a structural thing because, you know, you kind of create this kind of closed, privileged community where, you know, you have to be invited in. It's like this membership club or something. Um, so um, we did a pilot um, at the beginning of this year where we basically invited um, like all the, the people who have contacted us um, over the last kind of years, months in our inbox to ask about membership. And also like some networks that are on the edge of, of um, fund action that we know could help us to bring in underrepresented issues and underrepresented communities. Um, so we tested a form, like a very simple form for the first time. And through this process, we have like 30 new members that that came in with the whole induction process and induction session. Um, and again, the idea is um, in two weeks when we meet in person to evaluate this. And then hopefully, I mean, for short, for some of us, we hope that this is something that could then be repeated in the autumn where we would kind of, you know, have people um, yeah, apply, like not get invited in, but apply through a form. So if anybody here is listening, is based in Europe, uh, is doing grassroots, community-led um, activism, and you know, feels called, then uh, the best thing to do, I'll put it now in the in the chat box as well, is to send us an email uh, to the contact at fundaction.eu inbox. I'll put it in the in the chat now, and then you know we have you on our records. And when we when we open a new round also of members, then you will um, you will get contacted. I just wanted to make sure that uh, I got that invitation in. Yeah, exactly. And if people want to suggest, um, yeah, groups, please uh, please do. Thank you. Great. Uh we are in the last 15 minutes of this, so and there is one question which is, and I think it's a good one to end with. Um, what is the future of participatory grant making? Do you think bigger uh, or state sourced fund groups can be swayed in Europe? And I would ask outside Europe as well to this part. So basically, can we do a larger advocacy to get more people on the participatory grant making side of things? Or what does it at least look from your from where you are and your interaction with uh, funders? Uh, I mean, that would be my dream for sure. Um, uh, I don't know. We are about to uh, publish our annual report, if all goes well, I think next week. We're finalizing it now. And um, what we wrote, we actually did write um, a paragraph there under... You know, we wrote, we shared what we're grateful for, we shared what we're proud of, and we shared what we're concerned about. And uh, under the concerned about, we did actually <laughs> share that we are, yeah, kind of concerned about that there is a lot of, uh, there's definitely a lot of talk about participatory grant making. It has become this buzzword, it's become a growing community, which is positive, of course, firstly positive. But there's always this danger of, you know, like the greenwashing movement and all of these things that happen that it kind of becomes a label that is being put on practices. And, you know, people like to say that they do it. But if you look closer, according to, let's say, the, our definition of participatory grant making, it wouldn't pass, um, for example. So there we are a bit... I would say, I mean, also from my interactions and, you know, doing advocacy and philanthropy circles and so on, I'm a bit impatient. Like, I feel like I get stuck in a loop in like having the same, same conversations from the beginning. And I, I don't see a lot of like action really being taken. I also, I would personally like that also, you know, progressive funders when, you know, who are really, of course, the ones who are some of them really are doing amazing, um, amazing work in this area. But I think also there, there is still space for them to really, you know, kind of, yeah, step up from rhetoric to action and also hold each other maybe a bit more accountable uh, as well. I would love to see that. Um, yeah. But my hope is, uh, yeah, but I mentioned before, I feel, you know, this movement of like people, young people who, you know, of, you know, are part of this like generational wealth and who are really, 
pushing things and asking questions. They also do a lot of campaigning on like taxation of the rich and so on. I feel there they are really growing and this is like a, a momentum there that is growing. And I think, yeah, we are already collaborating with them. The only way, as we know, with all our work as activists and campaigning is to keep going and to keep repeating the same, the same and to hold them, um, yeah, accountable and lead by example, right? Like we, that's what we do in Fund Action. We do, we don't talk, we also talk. Which we also do so that um we can't get into the trap of yeah but it's not working and then no like we've been doing it for years we are growing um activists everybody confirms that you know it's a model that that works and that's needed yeah and yeah yeah and like for my side of it like i will add to it i mean i sorry did i no, I'm not. Oh, okay, perfect. Like, from my side of it, I also see, like, I also see the trend, you know, I also see the conversation going on uh, from a lot of, a lot of foundation and philanthropy. And this has been going on, like, I mean, I would say the conversation is so much more positive right now that it's they, like, there to talk about it, they dare to write, reflect about themselves, where, like, when we started with fund action, this was very difficult for us to explain in the funder what's actually like, you know, participatory way of grant making is, or like actually just decolonization of the non-thumpy means like, and um, I'm, like my concern is also again, like, you know, for how long will they be loud of like having this trend and when is the time for implementation? Because it seems like when you have conversation with a, lot of, with a lot of different philosophy they do definitely are reflecting and like putting a gender and like uh, power of systematic change and whatever you also highlighted in the beginning of this uh, workshop and then when you ask for action or oriented the, the process is like they're like, oh, we actually are reflecting about it within our own structure in the organization. And we still like struggle of the way, like, you know, how, who is in the power of leadership of the uh, foundation, who is in the power of like uh, distributing. So there is still, they are still stuck. I will say from my experience of, um, they're still stuck within their own structure. So I think also this, the conversation isn't just only about how do they collaborate with uh, like with other funders, but it's also really about themselves. How do they operate within such a like, you know, hierarchical uh, organization or foundation they are structured to. So I really have a hope about a bigger change on foundation, but I also say, but taking that conversation also to feminist funders, I see few feminist funders have been like practicing um, if it had been practicing um, participatory um, approach, which I think is very, very interesting. Um, but also like looking within the organization, it haven't had a big change within the power dynamic. And that's so a question for us, like to have in mind, like before we go and like looking into different structure, they are already operating within themselves that can affect us. Like that are receiving, uh, yeah, that are receiving what we have to receive. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carmen and Nina. No, I agree with that because when you speak about the high net worth individuals, for example, and one of the things that data said was that wherever we see high net worth individuals donating or that kind of money, philanthropy rising, those are also countries where inequality has ridden dramatically, um, including, for example, India and Brazil and some other countries. So, and we are also talking, like being cautious of the fact that we are talking about this at the time when there have been many legal, like use of legal frameworks to stop organizations from both receiving funds, but also working in their own spaces within the country. So there has been a lot of that kind of backlash. So I would like to remain cognizant of those movements that are also happening at the same time when we are talking of participatory grant making. Uh, but thank you so much, Carmen and Nina. We are um, 
there are no other questions in uh yeah i don't think there are any other questions uh and thank you for opening it up to our members and network members in uh, europe i hope some people get to attend it and apply and my few takeaways from this is definitely that uh it's the changing the changing conversation from competition to kind of confluence where Fund, funds and access to fund has the ability to kind of create network of organizations. It's very encouraging to see that uh, there are ways in which unregistered and organizations that cannot have all the due diligence and paperwork in place can still access funds. So those, those, those are definitely two of my great takeaways. And finally, this is a work in progress. And I think, uh, well, that's one of the great things about this kind of grant making that it keeps asking the questions so it's not stuck in the same spot uh so those are really really great so thank you so much um for sharing with us Carmen and Mina but also everyone from for just uh asking these really relevant questions and I hope uh this is one this is the first session and we're going to organize more and we're going to send out the email so yeah please join in ask the questions and let's see what we can make out of it towards the end uh yeah thank you so much everyone thank have, you so much. have a good night from my end but yeah a great day if you're just starting your day or you're in the middle of it thanks so much bye bye everyone. bye thank bye